All right, so welcome to lecture six. Uh, we're now sitting at week nine of 15, 14. So we're getting close to the end. Um, what basically this is today is a lecture on the select statement, or at least the beginning of it. Basically, the next three lectures are all going to be select statement. And of course, there are a few basic pieces I'm going to cover this week. And these are basically what's going to be, these are simple SQL statements, as in there's no joins or anything like that. Uh, so I'm going to cover the basic select statement. I'm going to describe what distinct does. I'll talk about ordering. And actually, some of that stuff won't even be listed on here. Aggregate functions and grouping may or may not happen depending on time. The select statement. A select statement is the meat and potatoes of working with a database. The insert statements you use once in a while. Select is constant. If you go to any website that uses a content management system like WordPress or Joomla, all the content is stored in a database. It's not files. It queries the database, reads the article, outputs it to you. Whenever you use your banking app on your phone, your app is interacting with some middle tier at the other end that's querying their database and giving you information. So the select statement is where the meat and potatoes is. It's very, very flexible, which also leads to the fact that it's easy to make mistakes with. The good news is the select statement's non-destructive. If you're only looking at things, you don't break things. And it's made up of two, three, four, five, six pieces. Now today we're going to focus on the first three pieces. And the pieces are as follows. Here are the six pieces. Now, these are in order. They're not put up there in a random order. When you're writing select statements, all the major pieces have to be put in this order. So you can't have the from in front of the select or the where in front of the from. Select. The select part is saying, what do you want to retrieve out of the database? Two weeks ago, I did a select star from whatever. And that said, return absolutely everything. Normally, you don't want to do that because it can be heavy on the data. You might be pulling too much back. So I'll be showing you guys how to restrict your choices there. From is a source selection. Usually, it's coming from a table. Uh, where? It's a series of conditional Boolean operations. Have you guys learned about if statements yet? Please say yes. Oh. OK. Imagine if statements with a different syntax. Um, and these are actually known as predicates. Uh, group by has to do with aggregate functions. Having has to do with aggregate functions, depending on how timing today goes. I'll cover it or not. Order by is optional. It allows you to sort your results. So those are six parts of the uh, NSQL statement, a select statement. Now, the first part, which is the field list, has two options. Asterisk, which means grab all available columns from all sources or a defined list separated by commas. So you can go select star, or you could go select ID comma name. Now, if it's a reference table, it's going to be the same data. But if you're dealing with like a, customer's, a customer table which has a person's name, their email address, phone numbers, full mailing address, full billing address, and a bunch of other columns, the amount of data you're going to pull back can get pretty big. And the more you pull back, the slower it's going to be. Therefore, you tend to want to restrict what you pull back. Um, I like to use this as an example. Most websites slash web servers will run um, their database server on a separate machine than their web server. So you have a database server that's the machine's been tuned and designed specifically for serving up data. Then you've got a web server that's been designed specifically for serving up web information. And they're talking to each other. Now, the problem is that they're talking down a wire. Most of the time, they're not connected directly to each other. They're connected via a switch or something else. And not everybody has the joy of working with Amazon services, where you don't have to worry about that pipe. But the pipe's that big. Let's picture the pipe's that big. Now, when you do a select star, and you pull back this much data, you've got to send it through a pipe that big. It takes a while to shove all that information through that pipe. 
It's a bit like when you know when you fill in your sink at home, then you pull the plug, the water doesn't disappear instantly, right? It only goes down as much as the pipe can carry. So if you're pulling back a large amount of data and you're trying to shove it down that pipe, it's going to take a while for all of it to transmit. If you restrict how much you're pulling back, then it's going to go through that pipe faster because you're pulling back less information. Um, for example, let's say a single row of data is 1K. I know, a K doesn't sound like very much, but let's say you pull back 1 million rows at 1K each. Now, if somebody's really clever with a calculator, they tell me how many megabytes that is. <coughs> it's a lot of data. So if you did a select star and each row is 1K, you pull back, say, A. Uh, so let's say it pulls back 10 megabytes. That's not the right number, but we'll say it pulls back 10 megabytes. You're trying to shove that down a pipe that big, and at the same time, you got five other queries trying to shove, no, 10 megabytes down that same pipe. Suddenly, the pipe's going to get congested because there's so much going through, you're going to limit it. On the other hand, if you select just specific columns, like, say, email address, then you might be pulling back, no, 30 bytes, 40 bytes. 30, 40 bytes is a lot smaller than 1K. That means that it's going to fit through that pipe faster, so it's going to go through. Less information needs to go through the pipe, so there's less water. The pipe doesn't get any bigger. You're just going to try to shove less stuff into that pipe. So select star is good during development. When you go to production, you don't want to do that anymore. You actually want to pick specific columns or fields. Okay. The next piece is the table list. That's their from statement. There's three types of lists. There's a single table, which is what I'm talking about this week. So I'm going to retrieve data from one source and only one source. I'm going to do joins, which will be covered actually not two lectures from now. It'll be covered next week, most likely. Derived tables, again, it'll also be covered next week. Um, it's one of the things that complicated is when you start doing joins. And an example of code would be from test. So if I went back to my previous slide, I go select ID, comma name, from test. That means I want the ID and name from a table called test. Then you've got conditionals. Conditionals are known as the where clause. It's a series of Boolean expressions. We have several operators we can play with and multiple clauses, and it supports brackets. How good is your algebra? You know, you always got to solve the brackets on the inside and work your way out. Same thing. You can choose how your operators work together and which sets affected based on the brackets. Now, the normal set, which is very similar to C-like languages, you have less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, not equal to. Congratulations. Not equal to is actually fairly recent innovation for everyone. Um, I think we've go, we got it in database maybe less than 10 years ago. Uh, we used to have the diamond operator. We called it the diamond operator. Less than, greater than. Because it's impossible for something to be less than and greater than at the same time. Therefore, it's always going to be not equal. Uh, the equality check is a single equal sign, which is where it throws people for a loop. Because a lot of Java people and C programmers, when they first come to SQL, they'll go, where a name is equal, equal, Dan. No, no, Dan, name equal to Dan, like equal, Dan. Single equal sign. Um, there's some special operators. There's in. In is a list. So where ID is in one, two, four, five, six, it'll give you a set of results that come back where the ID is one of those values. If that value is not found, it won't return it, but it also won't give you an error. It just returns. Give me anything that's in this list if you can find it. You can do between. It's an inclusive check. If I do ID between one and four, it'll give me one, two, three, and four. It's not exclusive, it's inclusive. Is allows for a check of nulls or booleans. Is it is null or is true? Because a lot of people make the mistake of 
where email equals null. I'll let you into a secret in computers. It's impossible to be equal to null. How can you be equal to something that, that's not? Null is absence of value. You cannot be equal to an absence of value. You can't compare to that. So the database guys, instead of shimming an SQL, shimming the equal sign to make it accept nulls, they said, you know what, we'll create an operator that actually checks for this. Is it is null or is not null? Or is true or is false or is not true or is not false? Because, don't forget, a database has three things, three states, right? Null, empty, and ha not empty. And you can check to see if something is empty. Equal to quote, quote, means it's empty. No, greater than whatever. Or, but is null means, is it null? Not, is it equal to null? Because you cannot be equal to null. Same thing with Booleans. Either it, it is true or it is false. But because database servers are special and you can also have a case of I don't know, also known as null, there's actually three states. Is true, is false, is null. That's why the is operator exists. And then you've got the not operator. The not is a um, modifier. It says not in this. <coughs> not in means if you say not in one, two, four, five, six, it'll give you three and anything greater than six and anything smaller than one. Not between one and four. It won't give you two and three. It'll give you zero and anything smaller than zero or anything greater than four. And is not null means, well, is it not null? Is there an actual value there? I don't care if it's an empty value or not. Is there just a value there? Now, Postgres has pattern matching. And this is the important slide of the pattern matching. Actually, I think I actually got rid of the second slide, but it might still be there. And if it's there, I'm going to skip it. Uh, basic matching using the like operator. It's case sensitive, just so you know. Unless you're working on MySQL, then it's not case sensitive. But it's usually case sensitive. Uh, Postgres provides something called I like. It's just like the like operator, except it's case insensitive. So it makes it insensitive. So you got like and I like. And it has something called wildcard characters. Now, you guys probably don't know what wildcard characters are. Um, essentially, it allows you to pattern match. And these two characters are used as placeholders for certain rules. The percent sign says match any, any number of times. The underscore means match any once. There must be something there. It cannot be empty. So for example, if I do ABC like ABC, that's going to come out as being true because, well, ABC is like ABC. I'm not following any patterns. If I say ABC like A percent sign, that means that I give me anything that starts with A and I don't care what's after. There could be nothing there. There could be the entire alphabet. I don't care as long as it starts with A. It'll evaluate to true. Same thing with ABC like percent sign A percent sign. It says, give me anything where you find the letter A in it. Percent sign goes, if I don't find a match, that's fine. We're going to assume there's nothing there. It'll find A and then anything after A. So A can appear anywhere in the string as the first character, any character in the middle, or the very last character, it doesn't care. The next one down is with the A, A, B, C with the underscores. It's saying there must be something in front of B. There must be something after B. I don't care what it is, but there has to be one letter before and one letter after. I don't care what those letters are, but B must be in the middle. It's a great way to check for postal codes, for examples. And if I do A, B, C like C, it's going to come out as false because A, B, C is not like C. Yes? Yeah. Percent. No, it'll return false because it's if you use if you go a which, which hang on there if I go A B C like capital A percent sign, it'll return false. If I do A B C I like 
capital A, then it'll return true because it does it case insensitive. <coughs> Please note, I like is Postgres specific. Other database servers don't give you I like. They have other mechanisms to do the same effect. MySQL is special because it's case insensitive for everything. It doesn't care. Just give me a minute. I know you've got a question. It's actually very difficult to actually do case sensitive matching on MySQL because by default it's case insensitive. You actually have to convince it to be case sensitive, which breaks like three quarters of all its functionality. Um, I'll show you guys during the demo one of the other ways to make it cross platform. Yeah. But so well, yeah, even if you had A, bunch of letters B, and you did 8% B, that would work. If it was just A, B, C, that would still work. Okay. Try that again. A percent says they must start with A regardless. A bracketed by percent signs means it can be the A can be anywhere inside the string. I'll actually do a bunch of demos when I do the demo of the pattern matching because it's like the, one of the most powerful features in SQL. For in the where clause is the pattern matching. It's kind of crazy what you can do with it once you start thinking outside the box a little. Yes? So the percent A percent, would that always, because anywhere in the string, anywhere. it Yep. It doesn't care. And if I wanted to actually find a string that ends in A, you'd go percent sign A with no percent sign, and that would just give you everything that ends in A. Must end in A. Yes, I did drop the next slide. Because it's actually as it was Postgres specific. I'm trying to be generic here. Okay. Uh, multiple and grouped conditionals. You can use and or or to check multiple conditionals. So let's say you got two rules you want to check. You can check multiple rules by separating the different predicates, also known as the Boolean operations, with either and or or. So if I look at the first example there, ID greater than four and name I like Dan. Anything, it'll find anybody whose ID is greater than four, whose name begins with D-A-N, whether the cap, it's capital D or not. It won't care. The second one will say anybody who's greater than four, whose name is, starts with Dan, or ID is equal to two. It will complete the and first, and then do the or. Um, now, some, one of the little things about this is it tends to resolve, there's an order of operations, and the order of operations is and, or, or not. And I'm actually going to put that on the last slide, I think the last slideshow of the term, so you guys have that in writing. So it'll always resolve the ands first, the ors next, and then the nots. And if it's, you know, not something, that's part of the rule. If that's part of an and, it'll resolve that one first, but it's and, or, or not. gets in that order. So if I had ID greater than four and name, ID greater than four or names equal to Dan, as I like Dan, and ID is equal to two, it would actually go, it would resolve the Dan and the ID. I'll, I'll demonstrate some of that in a bit. It'll make more sense to you when you see it happening. But depending on where you put your ands and your ors, it'll actually resolve sort of some, some parts of it before others. Yeah. And that would still resolve to be the same. Yeah. But let's say I move the brackets on the other way. Um, it would have to resolve. If I didn't have the brackets at all, it would resolve the same. If I swap the and and the or, it would do the and first before it does the or. Yeah, there is actually an order of operation to SQL. It's kind of gross. Uh, that, I, sometimes when you start having complex where clauses, you get caught with your pants down because you didn't put the brackets in the right spot because you threw an or here. And it always resolves the ands before it does the ors if there's no brackets. It'll resolve the brackets first, then it'll do the ands, then it'll do the ors. And if there's a not involved somewhere in there, it gets resolved last, but depending on how you've cho chosen to write it. Yeah? No, no, you can just use like, but like is case sensitive. So if you're looking for. You know, let's say you were looking for Dan anywhere, anywhere in the name. Yeah. Then if you left a capital D, you went percent sign capital Dan, it would find anything that starts with capital D-A-N. But if you're looking for like Jordan, you'd never find Jordan because the D's not capitalized in Jordan. So if you use I like, then you'd find the Jordans. 
No problem. Okay. Distinct is the next thing, and I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to be demonstrating some of this stuff. Uh, distinct is used to return unique values. Now, people find it challenging sometimes, depending on when you write queries, that what distinct actually does. So, w if you return star, odds are distinct isn't going to do anything because you're probably pulling back the primary keys, which are always unique anyways. But let's say you want to get the distinct list of just email addresses. So if you do select email from customers, and it comes back with a list of email addresses, you may have duplicated email addresses in there. If you did distinct email, then it'll only give you the unique email values, the unique values in the email field. Distinct gives you the unique combination of each column you've pulled back. So if you pull back name and email, then it'll look at the whole row and give you only the unique the versions of each row. As a rule of thumb, you want to distinct everything unless otherwise stated. Because that way you know you're always getting the, unique, the clean, unique values back. I'll de definitely demonstrate that one. Okay, ordering. Ordering is to sort. Ordering is fairly straightforward. You order by whatever the field is called. You can sort ascending or descending, and you can choose to sort by more than one field by putting them in a comma limited list. So order by field one, comma field two, it'll sort by field one, and then subsort by field two. Um, I'm guessing you guys haven't learned anything about sorting algorithms, right? No. Eh? Hey? Yeah, or the old good old fashioned bubble sort, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. At least he teaches it in that. It should be taught now. But when you do an order by, order by field one, comma, field two, you can choose to go order by field one descending, comma, field two ascending, and you use the short term ASC and DESC. <coughs> <coughs> All right. Now I'm going to do the demo. Actually, I don't need to go to the, do the break yet. I'll just do a demo. And then we get out of here faster. Okay. Oh, I've got a sinky chair. I'm sitting and I'm slowly going down. Great. Yeah, just hold on. There. If this one sinks, I got problems. Okay, who had the. You. Um, like, yeah. Uh, unless you set a default value, yes, it'll default to null. It's by de unless you've defined a default, yes, it's null. Well, every database server, yes. If you don't, unless you make the field not null, and then you have to give it a value. Uh, if you don't give it a value, it'll blow up, yes. All right. All right, so with this, I'm working against the ThinkCube database, the same database you guys have. So all these examples are all things that, you, that apply to you guys. All right. So I just returned 10,100 rows, and that took whatever number of milliseconds that was, 173 milliseconds. So as you can see, I've got lots and lots in here. And just show you guys the difference in performance. If I say just ID and name as opposed to the other thing, well, this 213 milliseconds, go figure, it didn't make it any faster. Um, I used to use a different client, and it would actually show you how many bytes were transferred, and that would really show you the difference. Um, but it will definitely come back faster, especially if you're talking from one server to the other. So that's selecting two different columns. So just show you guys the difference between distinct and not distinct. All right, so we see here we've got 10,000 rows, 10,100. If I tell it, give me the distinct names. 
8,795. That's because there's some names in here that are duplicated. Therefore, when I ask for distinct, it says, give me the first one you see, and only give me one copy at a time of each one you see. And then it will move on from there. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Usually you want to distinct as much as you can. That way you know you're always getting clean rows and reducing the amount you're pulling back. Yes? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Right? If you just want the list of distinct names, that's fine. If you want the list of distinct names and email addresses, now I'm back up to 10,000 rows because I don't have any cases where the name and the email is duplicated, the combination thereof. So if I might just ask them, give me all the distinct names, that's fine. Something that might be a little more useful is I want to know all the distinct cities my customers are in. Now I've got 2,149 distinct cities coming back. So these are all the different cities that are listed in my database. Apparently it's not handle, handling my uh, accents very well. So that's why the distinct is if when you want to pull out the unique values. And usually for that is you use it, use it more when you're doing aggregates, which I'm going to talk about next week. Um, but specifically, you want to grab the distinct values as much as you humanly can. Um, now, earlier I did names. We know there was 8,795. And there was how many cities? 2149. If I do the distinct name and city, you'll see I don't have 10,100. I got a 10,086. That means I've got 14 people that have the same name that live in the same city. Now, most of you in here are, have seen a phone book, right? Remember the white pages? There once was a time the auto white pages were like that thick, right? And out of curiosity, one day I looked my name up. In Ottawa, at one point there was 14 Daniel Goudros. Totally useless, unless you knew what part of Ottawa I lived in. Or at least you knew the city well enough. But, you know, it'd be a lot of phone calls. But, for example, name and city is not that useful. It's useful, it's not that useful. But it's, it is one way of what distinct does. So you can see what distinct does. That's what it does. The ones that are duplicated. Yes, there's a way of doing it with an aggregate. Do you want to remember that question for next week? Because I really don't want to get into it today. But yes, you can do that We're using an aggregate. And are you doing counts and halvings? You're using, you're doing math to figure it out. But yes, the database server can figure it out for you. That was like my happiest discovery when I learned how to do that. So that's the distinct. So, so far, so good. I'm going to go back to, I'm just going to want to pull everything back again. And while I'm at it, I'm going to grab email. Run it like this. So I'm pulling back my 10,000 rows. So, so far, nothing too complicated. I'm asking, give me the name, email, and city from each customer. Maybe I'm preparing a big mailer. And I want to email all these customers. And I want to personalize and say, hey, we will be in such, such a city on such, such a date. And, you know, therefore you can target your emails specifically to that. Now, we got the where clause. Let's say we want to grab anybody whose name starts with A. Here's a good example. And I'm going to run this. And I'm going to get nothing. Why? Case sensitivity. Now, if I was working on MySQL, and depending on your install SQL server, this would have worked. Because they're not case sensitive depending on circumstances. So if I did capital A, that would work. But as a rule of thumb, most of the time you want to assume it to be case insensitive because some people are stupid and they type everything without actually capitalizing. 
And it's not your place to tell them that, you know, they identify as a lowercase a. They're allowed to be a lowercase a if they want to be. So you have the choice of either doing I like, which will now work. Here's everybody who starts with A. That's cool. Or we can use a string function. And there's tons and tons of string functions inside Postgres. I don't go through them because it's crazy the amount there are. Um, but lower name. What this does is it takes the name, forces it to lowercase, and then it does a comparison. And that gives us the exact same result. This works everywhere. Lower is a generic SQL function, as in 99% of database servers implement it. So this is how you do a case insensitive like, or even a case insensitive equal in any database server. I'll be sticking to this more than I like because this is the generic way of doing it. It'll get you a better habit to have. And there's no performance gain because that's literally what I like does. I like lower cases the whatever's in front of it, so it's doing the exact same operation. Now to do some different pattern matching. Now let's say I want to find, earlier I used the example of anybody who's got the name Dan in it. Now, I'm going to make it not case sensitive for a moment. <coughs> now, we found all the Jordans. That's literally all the Jordans. But you notice we're not finding any Daniels because it wasn't case sensitive. If I were to make it case insensitive, now we'll find everybody who's got Daniel as a last name. Um, actually, I don't know if I got any Daniels as a first name in this. Lots of Daniel last names. So it'll find anybody in here who's got the letters D-A-N anywhere in their name. So that's how you do that pattern matching. Now let's say I want to find everybody who ends in Dan. I can take the percent sign off. And it'll give me nobody's name ends in Dan. That's too bad. But I could find anybody who ends in IN. There we go. Perrin, Moulin, Colin, Poulain, Cousin, Germain. A lot of French names in here. And uh, Robin. You know, there's a bunch of ends in IN. Now, earlier I was targeting, let's say I want to target people who have a specific combinations of letters in their name. Let's say I want to find anybody who's got an E, anything in an A, anywhere in their name. So I want anybody who has a letter E followed by one letter, followed by an A, anywhere in their name. It sounds like a stupid query, and it is, but it'll demonstrate this well. All right, so we got Evan, E, anything A. Lena, E, anything A. Chevalier, E, anything A. So you were trying to find a weird pattern match. There it is. It's good if you're not sure about the, how something is spelled. You know? Their name is Sherry. How's it spelled? S-H-E-R-R-Y, S-H-E-R-R-I-E, C-H-E-R-I-E. Who knows? C-H-E-R-E-E. -E. Sounds like they're screaming now. Shree. But, you know, there's varying ways of spelling things. And sometimes if you're not 100% sure, it's a good way to try to hit that, the weird spelling that you may get. And, you know, it's a good way to also check, you know, certain last names that end in S-K-I versus S-K-Y. And if you're not sure if it's I or I, you just S-K percent. Or S-K underscore. And it'll give you anything that ends in S-K something or other. So there's the pattern match. You, this is actually not so useful when you're searching for names. Well, it's useful when you're searching for names. It's really useful when you're searching for email addresses. Let's say you just want everybody that's at .org. I could go give me an email address that ends in ORG. There we go. And 
so there's how we end in ORG. And I'm going to keep this one up on the screen and for, I'm going to come back to this one in a minute. I'm going to go back to the name. And there's one last one I want to ask. I want to see if you guys can figure this one out. I want anybody whose last name starts with L-E. Can somebody figure out how to make that happen? Okay, I got two hands. I think his went first. That was the one behind you. Sir. Yes, sir. That's called cheating. But that's how you do it. If you have a field where you're absolutely guaranteed that the, light, the names are separated with spaces, that's how you'd find it. Now, we have a risk with this one where if you had a case where you had three names because the person has three names, Emily, Leanne, something or other, we'd catch the Leannes because they have a space in their name, right? Emily space Leanne. But there's not much we can do about that. That's why you don't tend to keep the names all in one field unless you have to. Or unless you don't intend to search by name very often. But yeah, that was the, the way how you do it. It's good. Somebody got it on the first try. Um, as you can see, the, percent, the, the space is sensitive. It cares. And it applies to all characters. If you need to match on a percent sign, you escape it. You guys have probably experienced this in Java yet. You know, you, go, you put a quote mark inside of a quote and inside of a string. And then you want to compare. You have to escape your quote marks. Then you normally in, in Java or C, you do something like that. If you want to go hunt for the quote. Well, if you need to escape the percent sign, you use a back. Uh, backslash, you need to escape the underscore, you again use a backslash also. So that's the, the one of the quirks of if you're, af if you're after actually a specific string that actually includes a percent, you have to escape the percent. Okay. I'm going to go back to email. Like ORG. Now I'm going to start demonstrating the end side of the deal. Now I'm going to say where the city is equal to Dublin. It has to be exactly equal to Dublin. <coughs> it cannot be Dublin something else. It has to be exactly Dublin. So here's all our dot orgs <coughs> in Dublin. So now we've got a bunch of names. And we've got a bunch of email addresses, and it's only people that are in Dublin. So now we're down to 83. Kind of cool. On the other hand, I want to have anybody whose email ends in org or the city is Dublin. Now, is that going to include or, or orgs that are in Dublin also? Yes, because it's, if either of these is true, give it to me. So we will have anybody that ends in org or anybody who's in Dublin that doesn't have an org or you'll have where it's either one is true. Be careful with your ors because it really opens up the net dramatically. Um, I'm trying to organize my next, th my next thought here. Let's say I want to go after two different email addresses. This is one that's more common. Okay. Now, we're lower emails like org or lower emails that like .ca. Yes. In this database, it is. That's 
that's only in the first name, you'd go pattern, string pattern, space, percent. It'll give you anything that before the space. Hang on, let me write it out. Anything before the space has to have AB. You're not really limited by any imaginations. Your only limit when it comes to the pattern matching. And there are actually more powerful pattern matching methods than this, but this is the one that's everywhere. Um, Postgres has another command called similar to, which allows you to give you a slightly more complex pattern, uh, but not all the database servers have it. And you can go past that and use regular expressions, which that's probably, I'm not talking Greek for at least half the group. Um, regular expressions are like the most powerful pattern matching thing on earth. And uh, you'll learn them eventually. Once you discover pattern matching, uh, regular, regular expressions, you'll love it. But you'll hate yourself at the same time because it's painful. And not all database servers, servers support regular expressions. Thus, I'm not covering the extras. All right. So any email that ends in either org or CA. So then we got all the CAs and the orgs, which is great. Now I can go end city. Again, I'll go back to Dublin. So I'll give you anybody whose city is either, the city is always Dublin, but either an org or CA inside Dublin. That's kind of nifty. It's a good way of handling certain things. Um, but if I change this to an or, it'll give me anybody who's got an org or a CA or anybody who's in Dublin. It just so happens it'll match the whole thing, but it'll also include some that we don't want. Now, let me demonstrate what happens if you take the brackets off. So remember earlier I had the brackets around this. So I said anything that ends in org or CA and the cities in Dublin. Now what's going to happen is, don't forget, it's going to resolve the end before it does the or. So now it's going to find this. So any dot CAs in Dublin. So there's our Dublin CA. And there's another Dublin CA. Now there's a Dublin.org, but what's going to happen is it's going to resolve this first. And if I didn't have any .orgs at all in Dublin, those wouldn't get picked up. That, but I would get anything that's like .org anywhere else. So it's resolving the and first. But you want to be really careful with your brackets and keep track of what you're doing when you do the brackets. Now. So right now I've done pattern matching. I've shown you how the and the or works in the brackets. That's fairly straightforward stuff. I'm going to throw in the order by. I'm going to sort by name. Now we're sorting alphabetically. Actually, I'm going to take the city off. All right, so here's all our names sorting alphabetically. A, A. You know, got all the Aarons, and then you got the Adams, and then the Adrians. If you know how to sort, it does exactly what you expect it to do. Now I'm going to sort by name and then by city. So it's going to sort all the names and then sort the order of the city. And it doesn't look like it's doing a whole lot of difference. But here's our Aaron Martin. Earlier, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't notice where they showed up. Okay, and that's 13. 12. Oh, bad example. They're already sorted alphabetically in that order. Do I have anybody else who's duplicated here? Right here. There we go. 75 is good. We got Agetzbois, Hamburg, and Berlin. So if I were to say sort by name and then by city, and I just got to jump back down to 75. Oh, not that far. 
be faster if I scroll. Now you'll see it's sorted Berlin before Hamburg because we're sorting alphabetically. So it's sorted all the names and then it's subsorted on city after that. So when you want to sort over here, we have to comma delimit. It always sort the first bin, then sort the second bin. And we could say we want the name sort of descending order. that will go Z to A, but the cities will be alphabetical. So subsorted in that. Do I have any duplicates close to the top here? Probably not. There we go. Say Yuan, Madet, Dublin, and Toulon. And it's sorted alphabetically the name of the city, but the names are sorted descending. So that's the order by. Now, outside of getting fancy, this is 90% of the basics that you need for SQL is demonstrated today. The where clause can be as complicated as you want it to be or as simple as you want it to be. Just remember, it's going to literally grab exactly what you told it to grab. So if you start having problems, you may want to start building up your clauses one piece at a time. Don't try to write the whole thing at once. Anybody here try to write like a 25-line Java program and get compiled the first try? How, how, how does that work for you? Or I should go turn around, but not 25 lines, that's actually doable. You know, let's go with a, you know, a major piece of code where you spent two hours coding and you haven't hit run once and it actually runs. Well, it's like that's the magic moment, right? That almost never happens. SQL is just like that. I tend to build my statements up piece by piece, make sure that each piece works before I add on to it. Uh, because you may end up with, you know, Shall leave that just like that. So I want everybody who's coming in Berlin, but I didn't notice I had a typo. Now suddenly I'm still getting results, but it's an invalid result because it's not going to work because it's not really what I'm after. Now, if I went like this, I'm still running an OR. Maybe what I wanted was an AND bring back the typo. I know this isn't working. But if I wrote this whole thing, I might be wondering what I did wrong. Instead of, you know, that last thing I added is where it broke. So you want to do it one piece at a time and build it up slowly. Because that way, at least you know when you suddenly stops working, you know where you made your mistake. Um, another thing that you have to learn is how to read the error messages. And I realize English isn't everybody's first language. I got that. But when you're dealing with SQL, especially Postgres, Postgres is pretty darn good at telling you what's wrong. Syntax error at or near city. And it even tells you, hey, by the way, here. 90% of the time when you get an error message, it's probably whatever's right in front of it. And I look at this and I'm like, What is missing? Wait a second, I don't have anything between my clauses. I was missing something. That'll work. Now, you guys have noticed I haven't been throwing in my semicolon. It hasn't barked. But if I were to do... But I don't put this. You'll get a syntax error near select. Why? Oh, well, because I forgot something in front of it. 90% of the time, whatever the mistake is, happened before. Now, I got one last topic to talk about. This one hurts. Hurts people. The one thing humans are really bad at is time and dates. The human brain is not wired to accept times and dates. Very few people natively know what time it is by default. We don't have, we're not, we don't have clocks built into our brains. And you ask someone, you know, how many, what, how many days differences between, you know, give them two dates, they actually sit there and have to start counting. 
how many days into the year are we? How many days into that year was it? And then, you know, add up all the difference between them. It, math sucks. Date math sucks. Dates and database servers suck. Okay. This is a keyword I didn't talk about yet. Limit. That goes right at the end. It's the very last thing of any SQL statement. Hello. It's for you. Limit 10 says just pull back 10 rows. So, Because if I don't do that, so how long did that take to run? Wow, it took forever. 86 milliseconds. If I were to pull it back without putting in the limit, 47,000 rows just got returned. There's a bit of data in there. So I'm doing limit 10 just to keep it simple. Now let's look at our timestamps here in our order date. Now, a few things you gotta notice. He uses the 24 hour clock. English speaking Canadians, you're gonna suffer. Non-Canadians and or French Canadians, you won't have a problem because they're used to dealing with 24 hour clocks. So let's just say I wanna find all the orders that are placed on November 2nd, 2016. Now, please notice how the date is organized. Biggest to smallest, year, month, day, space, hour, minute, seconds. In actual fact, if this did, if this data hadn't been imported originally from MySQL, there'd actually be a period here with a fraction of a second. Let's say I want everything that's Everything that's on November 2nd, 2016. I'm going to hit run. How many rows do you think I'm going to get back? Jack crap. Anybody want to take a, tell me, ask, tell me why? Got two hands. No, one behind you. He came up first. Yes. When you do this, and you don't, especially when it's a timestamp, in other words, or a date time field where it includes the date and the time. If you don't include the time, it assumes midnight. It fills in your time for you. There's not a single transaction in there, dead midnight. I made a point of making sure it never happened when I created this data set. There is no records at midnight. Therefore, this will return the exact same number of rows, absolutely nothing. So now people say, well, how do I find things that happen on that date? There's a couple of ways. You can go greater than or equal, which is cool. It'll grab you everything on that day and anything that happened after that day. So we'll start with that. And I don't know how to do this because I've been programming in another language too much. Greater than or equal. So it's giving me everything that happened on that day, whether it's 30 minutes after midnight or 6.05 at night. That's that. Now, if I want everything else that happened on that, now, some people make this mistake. They say, oh, I want everything that happened on that day. Now with this data set, that will work. Oh, and I should make that equal because there could be theoretically something happened at 59 seconds. That'll give me everything that happened on that day. And as you can see, the number's dropping. I'm down to 10 rows now. But Postgres is precise to a microsecond. So in theory, you'd have to write it like this. And it starts getting a little excessive, right? This is hundredth of a second, thousandth of a second, ten thousandths of a second, hundred thousandths of a second, a millionth of a second. It, it gets a little excessive. There's actually a cheat for this to make this happen. And we want to take a guess what the easy answer is. Yes, he's fast tonight. Yes. 
because it's, uh, don't forget, it assumes midnight. Therefore, anything that happened before that date falls in. So if I do this, again, I'll get my 10 rows. Working with dates really, really sucks. It really does. Um, you could rewrite this as follows. Now, this won't work because I didn't put quotes on this. What's this going to do? It's going to do math. 2016 minus 11 minus 3, which will give us 2003. Quote your dates because treat, to treat them as strings. They're not strings, but they act like strings. No, you can't pattern match. This will do the exact same result, 10 rows. This is functionally equivalent to this. Some people understand this better. Some people understand this better. I don't care which one you use. They're both the same. Yes? It assumes that. So theoretically, if the transaction was placed at exactly zero microseconds midnight, then it would be included for the ride. The odds of that happening, like almost non-existent. You can't say it's impossible, but it's almost non-existent. So honestly, if one transaction slid across, probably nobody would ever notice. But yes, your question is valid. Technically, that is not correct. Because it's inclusive. It includes the goalposts. This is, like I said, it's functionally equivalent. It's not, a, you know, exactly the same. Theoretically, this is more precise. Because <coughs> it's everything before. But functionally, these are exactly the same. It depends. If you're Amazon... This may actually happen. If you're like tea turtle, this will never happen. T-shirts. Um, cutesy, sarcastic T-shirts. So that's dealing with dates. Now, and I always have to look up this stupid syntax every single time. Let's just say we want to know everything that happened in 2016. Now, there's a few ways of handling this. I always, I always have to look it up again, every single time. There we go. We could go like this. Is it unit first, unit after? Unit first. I'm just going to grab the order date here just to minimize how much I'm pulling back. And I'm going to grab this function. And I'm going to run it. And I threw on my semicolon. It'll give me the 11s, all the 11s. So this means for so I can prove to you that, yeah, that's what it's doing. So it'll give me all the Novembers regardless. And now if I were to get clever and I go, duh. Now it'll give me, you know, each of the orders sorted by year, placed in November. Then if I take that limit off, it gives me 3,600 rows. So they'll go up for each, each November, year by year, now they're all the November 2015s. 
why can somebody guess why this kind of a query would be useful? Sure. Okay, yeah, that's a very precise example. Um, yeah, but that'd be for when, let's say you're working for a company and they care about what their year-over-year -year sales are for the month of November. Next week when I do the aggregates, <coughs> hopefully I remember to come back to, do, to show you guys this. But I could actually summarize the total sales or how many orders were placed in any given year during the month of November, so I could actually see what the trend was over the years based on this. So I could turn around and say, well, I just care about actually, let's go the first half of the month. And now it'll give me everything That worked right, didn't it? Yeah. Any sales that happened on the first half of the month? Apparently 2015 was a good time. 2014 didn't have any in the first half of the month. And then 2016, the first half of the month. You'll see none of the dates go past the 15th. So this is all the sales on the in November from the first to the 15th. It's a very precise kind of query. It's not something you write every day. But these are the kinds of queries that managers get curious about. Trust me, I've had to write these. How many leads registered during this time frame last year compared to this year? That's the questions I get. And it'd be, you know, this time frame to this time frame over this year to that year. And then they, then they turn it around and say, well, what was the source of the lead also? So then they want to know how the freaking lead got into the system. And these are the kinds of queries you'd write. Dates are terrible to work with. Because when you first start working with them, you always forget about the time and how the time affects it. If you get over the time, that's great. Now, there is one other way of doing all this, and some people will actually prefer it. I always keep it at the end because by now most people aren't listening anymore. And it's not as important. And I got to make sure I don't close this window before I copy my query history. <laughs> um, I can go, and we know order date's a timestamp, right? Whoa, not order minus date. Now this looks a little weird. This is called casting. You'll learn about it later in Java. Basically, I'm taking one data type and I'm converting it to a different data type. Now, I'm taking my order date, which is a timestamp, and I'm going to convert it to a date. And just so you can see what it actually does, actually, I'm going to take out the where clause for now and just show you what happens. Uh, oh, of course it is. It's ambiguous. Oh, there's another important one. It doesn't know what you're talking about, but I'll talk about that one until I start talking about joins next week. Ambiguous means the SQL parser doesn't know what the heck you're asking because there's something that's in there more than once. Here's order date, and here's the casted order date. Look at this, we don't have a time on here anymore. Oh, come on. <coughs> and here's our rows again, ignoring the time. Some people like this better. Yes. If you remove the order, it'll still do it, but it just won't show it. Yeah. Some people prefer this. Not all servers support casting. You have to use a different function, like each server has different functions. Postgres is kind of cool. It lets you do a cast. Um, you could actually cast to a time, so you could actually say what time of day. So you're curious, you want to break down your totals based on what time of day, so you can see what the trend through the day was. You could do it with this also. You could cast it as a time and just pull out certain parts. 
<coughs> um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for that. Um, like I said, dates suck because people forget about the time. Always take your time into account and it'll, your life will be a lot better. Um, outside of that, what's going to happen next week is I'm going to talk about aggregates and time permitting joins. And once that's all said and done, um, I'll be doing more demos again. Uh, outside of that, it's, uh, that's it. Lab six is, you know, what you're going to be working on. Any questions before I shut, I stop recording? Yeah, I will. I'm going to stop my recording first. I don't need to record myself copy-pasting.